So what do you think of when you think of Miami? Maybe it's the beaches, the warm weather, boulevards lined with palm trees, and millions of tourists who flock there every year. Someday you might also think of a wall. That is what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is saying we might need to save this city from sinking into Biscayne Bay. A draft report by the Army Corps proposes a flood wall 20 feet high and six miles long. It would run parallel to the coast, protecting Miami from rising sea levels. The wall would take an estimated five years and six billion dollars at least. The advice is a wake-up call for many Floridians that climate change is happening right now and the threat is very real. According to NOAA, global warming gives Miami a 25% chance of a so-called 100-year flood by the end of this decade. This city is facing a threat like nowhere else. Miami is actually the number one city in the world exposed to coastal flooding in terms of assets exposed. So what that means for us, for those of us who you know, live and work in the area, is that our livelihoods are at stake. If you've been living in or near South Beach all these years, or even some inland parts of West Miami-Dade County, you've probably already noticed changes. Those sunny day floods, when the ocean rises seasonally in parts of town, they are four times more common today than 15 years ago. And remember Hurricane Irma back in 2017? That is the kind of devastation we could see more regularly if the city's infrastructure is not upgraded. Now, the good news is that some people are taking action on both sides of the aisle. GOP lawmakers have controlled the Florida legislature for more than 20 years. But back in 2019, they admitted that they had ignored climate change for so long, they lost a decade in fighting it. Last month, Florida's Republican Governor Ron DeSantis signed the statewide flooding and sea level rise resilience bill. It will put millions of dollars towards this effort. And tomorrow, the American Conservation Coalition will be in Miami for what it calls the first conservative climate rally. The group plans to push for climate change action on the right. Now, it remains to be seen how many conservatives will register and how others on the right will respond. So will these efforts be enough to avert a disaster of oceanic proportions? And what lessons can the rest of the U.S. learn from what Miami is facing now? Joining us to discuss it is Francis Suarez, the mayor of the city of Miami. Mayor Suarez, welcome to the program. Thank you, Joshua. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Can I just ask you, first of all, today is June 4th. We are four days into the Atlantic hurricane season. What are you thinking of right now as South Florida is getting ready for what the National Hurricane Center projects could be another above average year? Well, we prepare for every hurricane season. If, uh, we're going to get with one of um, we're always uh, preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. Um, luckily, over the last 20 years, we've actually only been hit with uh, two Category 1 hurricanes and one tropical storm. Uh, one of the ones is the one that you highlighted, which was Hurricane Irma, that hit us in 2017. Um, but one of the few uh, facts that people don't know is that Miami has actually suffered less hurricane damage in the last 10 years than New York. And I was reading an article today that talked about the vulnerabilities of San Francisco. So to your point, uh, all coastal cities in America, whether it's New Orleans, San Francisco, New York, uh, have to be prepared and have to be more and more resilient for superstorms that keep coming uh, with greater intensity and greater frequency every single year. The good news for us, as you said, is we're not burying our head in the sands. We understand uh, the problem exists. We're actually dedicating resources as a city and, as you said, as a state and hopefully as a federal government uh, to deal with this issue head on. I hear you in terms of coastal cities. I used to live in San Francisco and look at some of the damage along the Pacific Coast Highway whenever there is flooding and erosion and chunks of the highway literally falling into the Pacific. And even today in New York with the rain that we had and how it snarled the subway system and changed my route to 30 rocks. So, yes, this is definitely a national problem. What do you think of this Army Corps idea, a 20 foot, six mile seawall off the coast of Miami? Does that sound feasible to you? What do you think? You know, it's, a, it's what's called the back base study. Um, we are working with the Army Corps of Engineers. Obviously, anytime the federal government wants to spend $6 billion to improve and protect your property, um, it's not something that you, uh, you know, sort of take for granted. Uh, so we are working with them. We think, uh, based on some architectural renderings and studies and, and collaboration with the private sector, can be done in a way that actually adds to the physical landscape of our city. Um, we've seen how cities in Denmark uh, and throughout 
uh, the country and, and even places like Dubai, which has actually built cities in the water, um, have uh, the engineering capabilities of protecting our properties in a way that doesn't create uh, what is like a physical uh, or aesthetic nuisance. Here's what I wonder. I wonder about two things. One, people talking about the aesthetics of it. Oh, I don't want it to be ugly. I moved to Miami for the view. Don't obstruct the ocean view. And that's part of the issue is that it just makes Miami less pretty. And so I don't want to spend money on it. And two, that the city has these traumatic, dramatic differences in the top and bottom of the economic chain. Life's very different for you if you live in one part of Coconut Grove close to Miami City Hall as opposed sure. to close to US-1. Life's very sure. different if you live in Little Haiti or if you live in Overtown or Liberty City versus other parts of the city, the, the Arts District, Midtown. Sure. So depending on what's done, it could dramatically change the lives of people even more simply because of income inequality in Miami. How do you deal with that? Well, there's two things there. The first is uh, we don't think that a lot of these concepts are mutually exclusive. In other words, we don't think that something has to be uh, effective but ugly or, or you know, ineffective uh, but, but uh, for some reason, aesthetically pleasing. So uh, we don't think that those concepts are inconsistent with each other. Just like we don't think, uh, and as a Republican, and you mentioned this at the beginning of the program, we don't think uh, that as a Republican or as a Democrat, first of all, I don't think this is a partisan issue. So we don't think that the environment and the economy should be adverse to each other. On the second point, which uh, we're probably the only city in America that's actually studying and has funded a program to combat what we call climate gentrification, which is the phenomenon, the possible phenomenon that if people decide to uh, buy and construct inland uh, at higher elevations, it may push people out of uh, some of the classic neighborhoods that you described, like Overtown and Liberty City. Um, and so we're actually uh, creating a program that allows people that live in those neighborhoods to be able to renovate their properties and never have to move out uh, with uh, funds through our Miami Forever bond program that they actually won't have to pay back. So, uh, you know, we're exploring that concept as well. I think we're the only city in America that's doing that. Uh, so we're very much on the cutting edge of uh, not only climate policies that are going to protect our city, but climate equity policies that are going to protect some of our historic neighborhoods. Mayor, I hope you'll keep in touch with us on that program. I'd be fascinated to know how that works because you know the city of Miami's history as well as I do. It's always the people at the bottom of the economic food chain who get the worst of it while the people on the top often benefit from whatever happens civically. So I'd, I'd be fascinated to hear how that works. I heard you say that this should not be a partisan issue and I just want to be clear the mayor's office of Miami is a nonpartisan office, even though you are a registered Republican. But you and I both know it's a partisan issue. We know exactly what the rhetoric's been like on the left versus the right, among Democrats versus Republicans, about climate change, just even its existence, just the fact that humans are affecting it. So clearly this is partisan in some ways. Is there anything you would like to see the rest of the country, the rest of your GOP brothers and sisters learn from what's happening in Florida to maybe move this conversation forward and not let it just get stuck along lines of left and right? Of course. I mean, first of all, let me just begin by saying that, you know, inequality is, is not a Miami problem. It's an urban America problem uh, that we all need to, uh, you know, face uh, as a country and, and, and come up with creative solutions uh, to create more equity in our in our uh, country and our society. But the second part is I, I completely agree with you. I think uh, it's going to take leadership. And that's why we're doing this climate rally tomorrow, this conservative climate rally to start changing the narrative and start talking about this issue differently. For example, when you talk about, you know, we come we came up with this phrase that I was, I was actually my, my head of policy who came up with the phrase that uh, the environment is the economy. It's not up in opposition to the economy. And I think you have to start talking about uh, you know, sea level rise and climate change as a national security issue, because it is a national security issue. If you have food shortages, food shortages as a result of climate change in other parts of the world, that could create wars that could bring the United States into a global conflict. So you have to start looking at these issues in a much broader context so that they make sense to a broader a swath of people in the world. That's why I was blessed uh, to be elected by 86%, as you said, in, in a nonpartisan position and hope to be able to carry that message if I become reelected in November to the U.S. Conference of Mayors as president in January as a part of an urban agenda for America. Could I just ask you before we go, there's so much of the city of Miami to love. I think it's a vastly underestimated and misunderstood city among many American cities. There's so much work that's been done in the city over the last few years to protect its history, its culture, its economy. Just Virginia Key Beach State Park being restored, which was the historically black beach during the days of segregation. That restoration was a huge step for the city. 
Is there any part of the city of Miami, before I have to let you go, that you would miss the most if climate change claimed it? What part of the city is closest to your heart that you don't want to see get swept away? I think our historic black neighborhoods, the ones that you mentioned, Overtown, Liberty City, uh, uh, you know, the, the Bahamian Grove, uh, obviously Virginia Key, uh, which is a historically black beach, we're actually in the process of hopefully uh, building uh, an African-American museum in Virginia Key as well. So those are all areas that are extremely vulnerable. Little Havana is also an area uh, which is extremely vulnerable uh, because of its proximity to uh, uh, high-lying areas that are close to coastal areas. So there are a variety of areas that I, I certainly want, wouldn't want to see, but I'm an, I'm an optimist. I have to be. I get paid to be, right, as mayor of the city of Miami. I'm the chief sort of marketing officer for the city. Right. But I just want to reemphasize that we have a Miami Forever plan that's $200 million. We're going to hope to leverage it with some of the hundreds of millions of dollars that you articulated that was being uh, allocated by the state government. And then also, if the infrastructure bill passes, there's a, a ton of money in the infrastructure bill uh, for resiliency, but which, by the way, as part of the Global Council on Adaptation, right, uh, right. our studies have shown uh, that for every dollar that we spend prophylactically, we save $7 in post, uh, uh, you know, post-recovery costs. So it makes all the sense in the world to spend the money up front. Lots to love about the city of Miami. I certainly hope that it can be saved from climate change. Mayor Francis Suarez, I appreciate you making time, sir. Thank you very much.